we are in this journey in Genesis. And last week we talked about how Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for his son named Isaac. So we have Isaac and Rebekah. We, we talked about kindness, how important it is. And, and this, this whole story of how it just really happened the way God had wanted it to happen. And so we are going to jump in tonight and kind of fast forward. But before we jump into that, I need to know, how many of you have siblings? Brother or sister, just lift up your hand. All right. If you have a brother or sister, lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. Okay, so mostly everyone in the room. Put your hands down. How many of you have ever got in a fight with your brothers or sisters? All right. All right, all right, all right. I see these hands. All right, put your hands down. Now let me ask you another question. How many of you ever got in a real fight? Like, I'm talking like knock down, drag out, like fight, blood, weapons, shoes, anything you could find type of, all right. See, almost everybody has their hands up. That's insane, insane. Yo, I'll tell you this. There is no one that can make you more frustrated or mad than a sibling. Like, there is nobody that will get you as fired up, as angry. Like, you know, like, you could wake up and be in a good mood. Your brother or sister says one thing to you, and like, I'm going to throw you out the window. You know what I'm saying? Like, you get that fired up at them. And I know, I know a lot of you, I tell a lot, I tell my story a lot. I talk about my family. I talk about, you know, everyone in my family a lot. I have talked to you a lot about my brother, Schuller, who's my younger brother, I've talked to you a lot about my little sister, Eden, but I have not often talked about my older sister, Katie. So we got a picture of Katie. You want to throw that up there? This is my older sister, Katie. So she is a year and a half older than me, all right? So she's a year and a half older than me. She's got two two kids, my niece and nephew, and she's married to her high school sweetheart. But Katie and I are so close in age. And I remember when we were little kids, Katie and I would play together all the time, but the problem was Katie and I also didn't get along because Katie has a different personality than I do. Katie likes to follow the rules. Katie does really good in school. Katie is like, you know, she, she's at like, kind of like a type A personality. She kind of does all the, you know, it has to follow all those things. And me, like when I was a little, you know, I didn't always follow the rules. I didn't always do really good in school. And sometimes what would happen with Katie and I is we would, you know, we would get into, you know, some fights sometimes. We had this like love-hate relationship. Now that we're older, we have more of that like love-hate relationship. And like, it's funny because when you have a sibling and you're tight with that, like you can make fun of your sister as much as you want. But if anyone else makes fun of your sister, they're done, right? Like, I will fight you, all right? And like, that's how Katie and I were. We were so close, and even in high school, the age demographic. But as you can see, we don't look really much alike. Like we look, we, we know, I, I have dark features, she has light features, and our personalities are totally different. So that would cause us to often clash and fight. Now, we were, we were texting back and forth this week, just kind of telling stories and everything like that. And she reminded me of a story when we were little, and I don't remember like the details. But when I was younger, apparently I was very selfish. And like I was a selfish person and I liked when something was mine, it was mine. You know what I'm saying? Like some of you are, some of you are like, yeah, I'm selfish already. Like it was mine. Well, for whatever reason, me and her got in this little fight and she like apparently did something to me that made me so mad. And I left the room and I went downstairs to where all of like my toys were. And I grabbed a wiffle ball bat, one of those plastic wiffle ball bats. And I proceeded to chase my sister around the house, swinging at her head with a baseball wiffle ball bat. You know, and and from what I understand, I connected a couple times to her face and to her head, running around, and we and like we will fight all the time. I remember all of the time we fight. But I, I asked her, I was like, do you remember like exactly why I wanted to hit you? with a wiffle ball bat, and she goes, well, you were just very mean when you were little. I was like, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. But we fight with our brothers and sisters. That's what happens. That's how family is. And tonight I'm going to tell you a story where we're going to fast forward in this story of Isaac and Rebecca, and we are going to look, because we've talked about this beautiful love story of when Isaac and Rebecca got married and all these things. Well, here tonight, and what we're going to talk about is Abraham had passed away, and Isaac and Rebecca are now older. 
And Isaac and Rebecca, they want to have kids. They're praying for kids. And God provides them this promise. Because remember, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, that he would all have all these thing, good things that would happen for him. Remember, we talked about that. And then that promise is not goes from Abraham, it goes to Isaac now. So Isaac has this promise where he'll be able to pass this down through all the generations. Well, if he doesn't have kids, how's that going to get passed down? So they begin to pray and seek the heart of God, and they ask for kids, and God grants them these kids. Now check this out. You want to talk about fighting at an early age? Look at this, Genesis chapter 25. It's on the screen behind me. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies fought each other within her. And she said, what is happening to me? So she went to inquire the Lord. The Lord said to her, there are two nations that are in your room and two people from within you who will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, she had twins. The first that came out was red and his whole body was like, he was like a hairball, like a red hairball. His name was Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, and his name was Jacob. So we talked about fighting within brothers and sisters, fighting back and forth, all that. These two were fighting inside the womb. They're already going at it. And and Rebecca's like, what is going on? So she went and prayed to God, and God's like, oh yeah, my bad. (laughs) I forgot to tell you, they're going to fight all the time. They're going to be at war with each other all the time. They were at so much war with each other, they were trying to fight to see who came out first. And when Esau came up, Jacob was actually grabbing his brother's foot when he came out of his mother's womb. And that's what we read here in the story, that this is how these two happen. It would go back and forth, and they, and they would fight. And so we have to understand that these two were birthed, when they were birthed, they were birthed at all in each other, wanting to fight one another. Now, as they grew older and as they kind of grew up, they kind of separated in their likes and interests. Esau was an outdoorsman. Probably liked to wear camo, hunting, fishing, liked to do all that, shop at Bass Pro, go check out all the boats, fishing poles, all that. He loved to be outside. He loved to be real outdoorsy. He loved all of that. How many of you like to be outdoors? You like to fish, you like to hunt, you like to do all that. So this is what he was. Esau was an outdoorsman type guy. He was like your rough, tough guy. Remember, it said that he was hairy, so he's a man. A hairy man. But then there's Jacob, right? Jacob's a mama's boy. Straight up mama's boy. And Jacob don't like to go outside. Jacob likes to cook. He likes to probably read his, his little books. He probably, today's age, he'd go to Starbucks and sip his little latte with his little man Uggs on his feet. And he would probably like, you know, have his Spotify on and he'd be listening to acoustic music while at Starbucks, just kind of listening to his thing. But not only was he a mama's boy, but he was a little deceptive mama's boy. Like, so there was something about his nature that was very deceptive. So how I see this is, see, some of you fight with your brothers and sisters and like you go all out and you brawl and you fight one another. But then some of you probably fight a little bit smarter than your brothers and sisters. Like, let's talk, about that. let's talk about framing. Have you ever framed your brother and sister to get in trouble? Oh, yeah. See, everybody's smiling in here. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you know, you start arguing back and forth, and your mom's like, you all better stop. You all better stop. And then you're like, you know, you, you, keep, you keep talking to me. I'm going to get you in trouble. I'm going to get you in trouble. And then you, you smack yourself in the face, and you fall on the ground, and mom goes, like, he hit me. And your mom goes and, like, chases your brother around the house, and you're like, ha, 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 ha. You know, because you hit yourself. Like, Frame drop. This is how this dude was. He was deceptive in the nature of who he was as a person. So he was probably always kind of scheming, deceiving. He, he probably planned out how he was going to fight dirty. And he was a manipulator. And he comes up with these ideas and get there. Just total opposite. So you have Jacob and you have Esau. Now understand back in this culture, if you were the firstborn son, you got what was called the birthright. All right, I want to talk to you a moment about this because I want you to kind of understand this, the birthright. Now, remember, Esau and Jacob literally fought to come out of the womb even as little babies fighting. And Esau was the first one out, so he is the oldest boy, and he's the chosen one to have the birthright. 
And the birthright wasn't just an inheritance. It wasn't just something small, but the birthright was something huge. It was, it was the entitlement of everything that your family owned now belonged to you. You were the master of the entire estate of all of the money, of all of the possessions would be yours. And it was also noted that you were the head of the family now. So you were in charge. You would get cash, you would get land, you would get possessions, you got it all. Now, the birthright was everything that the oldest son would want. The oldest son knew, you know what? If I, like, I'm older, I'm going to inherit all of this. And so he was the recipient of that. The inheritance was sometimes also doubled. They would also have more than not enough to get to them and to have that. And then the other siblings would just kind of get a few things here and there. So I want to jump ahead because I want you to understand the importance of the birthright. It was very important to have. It was something that you really, really wanted. But I'm going to tell you a story now, and then we're going to jump into the night's message. I'm going to kind of fast forward for you so you understand. So Esau they get, and Jacob grow older, all right? Like I said, Esau likes to go out and hunt. Jacob likes to sit home and drink lattes and cook and do all that stuff, all right? Total opposite. Well, one day, this is the story that happened, that is set in Genesis chapter 25. One evening, Esau returned from being out hunting. He felt hungry. How many of you have ever been hungry before? Now, how many of you have ever been like, hungry before like you literally come in the house and you just start eating everything like the weirdest like you grab a like a slice of bread you grab some cheese it's you grab some you know ice cream you grab it on you're just like literally the weirdest combination you've ever had in your entire life you're eating i've been there i do it like on wednesday nights i go home i'm like oh chips and salsa oh cereal oh cookies oh tuna oh like i go crazy because i'm hungry so esau was hungry and he because he came back from hunting and as he comes back from hunting Jacob is in, and he's cooking a good stew, a big soup. I don't know if it's Campbell's. I don't know if it's Raymond Noodles. I don't know what it is, but it smelled really good to Esau because Esau, again, he was out hunting all day. He was super duper hungry. He wanted to eat. Jacob is home cooking. So he comes in, and Esau like runs in. He sees his brother cooking. He's like, bro, I am so hungry quickly. Give me some food. I'm starving. I need something to eat. And Jacob kind of stared at Esau and the wheels begin to turn in his mind and he says all right I will give you something to eat if you give me your birthright all right just just listen he said if you give me your birthright I will give you some soup Esau was only interested in one thing his hunger his immediate need right and this is what he says What good is my birthright to me when I'm dying of hunger? He replied, let me eat and traded his birthright. And he said, promise me. Jacob said, promise me. So Esau swore an oath to Jacob promising to hand over the birthright for a bowl of soup. Now, first of all, you got to understand this. Esau is literally saying like, I'm dying. Okay, a little bit of a drama queen thing going on here. Like, how can I have my birthright if I'm going to die and not eat this bowl of soup real quick? But you've got to understand, his hunger in the immediate, in that moment, in the present moment, his hunger was the thing that controlled him. It was the one thing right immediately that he said, no matter what, like, I I want it now, and I'm not going to wait. Yeah, I don't really care about the birthright. Just take it. Give me what I want right now. Sounds kind of common to how we are in society sometimes. We're not willing to wait for the one thing that God has for us because we immediately want what we want right now. God, I want it to happen now. Give it to me right now. I want it all in possession right now. And that's how Esau was. He was so demanding of what was right now. So Esau went on and ate greedily and ate all of the food. Again, remember, he was the rightful heir to the birthright. When he got in the pinch, he sold it out and said, nope, I'm gonna have some soup rather than the birthright. He took opportunity that would benefit his entire future and threw it away. So what happens now is a couple years go by. A couple years go by, a couple years go by. And, you know, sometimes when a few years go by, you know, you, you forget some things and you don't always recall what you've done. And, you, you know, you have, you have a memory and you're like, I don't really remember this. But then this interesting story happens in Genesis chapter 27. It's a little bit lengthy. I want to read through the whole thing because I want you to understand this. It'll be on the screen behind me. So when Isaac had become an old man and was nearly blind, 
He called his eldest son Esau and said, my son. He said, yes, my father, I am an old man and I'm, I might die any day now. Do me a favor. Go get your quiver of arrows, your bow, and go out to the country and hunt me some game, meaning go get me some food. Fix me a hearty meal, the kind you know that I like, and bring it to me to eat so I can give you my personal blessing before I die. So Isaac's like, yo, Esau, I'm gonna die at any moment. Dad is gonna go. I need to give you the inheritance, so go out, hunt, get what you need to, and come back and cook it. But Rebecca was eavesdropping. Remember Rebecca from last week? She was eavesdropping. And she was listening what was being spoke to, to, to Esau. As soon as Esau had gone off to the country to hunt for his father, Rebekah said to her son, I just overheard your father talking with your brother. And he said, bring me some food, a hearty meal, so that I can bless you with God's blessing before I die. This is what Rebekah says to him. Now, my son, listen to me. Do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and get two young goats and kill them. I will prepare them into a hearty meal, the kind that your father loves. Then you'll take it to your father and he'll eat it and you'll get the blessing before he dies. But mother, Jacob said, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I have smooth skin. What happens if my father touches me? He'll think that I'm playing games with him. I'll bring down a curse upon myself instead of the blessing. If it comes to that, said his mother, I'll take the curse on myself. Now go and do what I say. It gets crazy here. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother and she cooked a hearty meal, the kind that her father loved so much. Rebecca also decided to dress him up in clothes of Esau and put them on her younger son. But then she took the goat skin and placed it on his, on his hands and on his neck and the smooth of his neck. And she placed the hearty meal she had fixed. And so then he goes into his father. He went into his father and his father, he said, my father, he said, which son are you? Jacob answered his father, I am your firstborn son, Esau. I did what you told me to do. Come now, sit and eat my game so that you can give me the blessing. Isaac said, so soon? How did you get it so quickly? Because your God cleared the way for me. Let's pause for a moment. You wanna talk about deception on another level. Number one, your father is blind. He can't see, so he doesn't know what's going on. And probably at that age too, he's not only blind, but probably his sense of taste isn't where it really should have been and, and really where it was. So not only do you come in and you, you basically lie to your blind father, you cook a meal that's not yours, you steal your brother's clothes, you kill goats and put them on you so that you can miss him hairy. And then when your father asks, who is this? You lie and say, it's Esau. And then not only that, when he responds, how did you do this so quickly? What does he say? Because God made a way for me. So even to the point of deception, he blames God. And it's interesting because this story is kind of crazy that we see this. Isaac was really, Isaac was old and he was getting ready to die. Esau was here, Jacob was here. But Jacob wanted the blessing so bad, he wanted this so bad from God that he was willing to sin to get what he could have. I don't have time to get in that tonight. That's a whole other message. But realize the lengths of what he went to to get what he wanted to get. He was willing to lie to his father. He was willing to be deceptive. And he was willing to say, oh yeah, God made the way for me to get here. So that I'm able to do this. So Isaac blesses Jacob. And Jacob gets the blessing and not Esau. But as he is leaving, Esau shows back up. And he starts cooking no, not knowing that the blessing is gone. Let's jump back to this story. It says, he came to his father and said, let my father get up and eat his son's game that I have had, might have that personal blessing. And Isaac said, who are you? He said, I'm your son, your firstborn. It's, it's Esau. Isaac began to tremble and shake violently. He said, then who hunted the game and brought it to me? He said, I finished the meal just now before you walked in and I blessed whoever that was. He's blessed for good. Esau, hearing his father's word, what's it say here? He sobbed violently and bitterly and he cried to his father, my father, can you also bless me? He said, your brother came here falsely and took your blessing. See, it's interesting when you read this portion of scripture, you read this and your heart kind of breaks. 
Because you're like, dang, man, that, like, that, sucks, for, that sucks for Esau. He sold, like, this dude wanted the blessing, and he must have forgot what had happened. But remember, years ago, he sold his blessing out for what? A bowl of soup. But we need to understand that Esau isn't who we think that he is. So we read this portion of scripture, and we're like, oh, this is good. But when you jump into Hebrews chapter 12, you find out that Esau is actually a, not a good dude. He actually doesn't care about the things of God at all. It actually says that he is a sexually immoral man. He's godless. He is one that sold his inheritance for a, a, uh, a bowl of soup. And you know, he wanted to inherit the blessing he was rejected. He sought a blessing in tears, and he could not change what had been done. See, you got to understand, Esau was a man that he didn't care. Because if he really would have cared about the inheritance, he never would have gave it up. He never would have gave it up. And he never would have allowed his brother an opportunity to take what was given to him. And we have to remember, when we approach God and we approach things like this, we, we have to say, are we willing to go after what God has for us? See, near the end of Isaac's life, of their father's life, we got a glimpse once more in the way they approached life. When the father was on their deathbed, Esau should have been there saying, okay, what is it that you need? What is it that can happen? What can I do? No, it wasn't Esau that was there. It was Jacob. And Jacob knew, you know what? I gotta take this opportunity. I'm gonna run with this, and I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get this blessing from God. And on this occasion, you know, Isaac had already lost. Dad was blind. And when it came time for the blessing, Isaac sent Esau out to hunt to get the food. Isaac knew the short-sightedness of, of, you know, Esau possessed, and he knew that, you know, Esau wasn't exactly who he should have been. See, Isaac had wished that Esau was so much more than what he was. Because when we also read, we saw that Isaac had asked his sons, do not marry any women that are outside of, outside of the tribe that we are. And Esau decided to go and have sex with women outside of that. Esau decided to go and have a wife outside of the chosen tribe that he was supposed to be with. See, Esau did not care about the things of God. He didn't care about the, the, all these things. And so Jacob's like, you know what? I care about it. And, and Jacob was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going I'm to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And we look at this, and I read this story, and we talked about it in the office today. Right or wrong? However we see this, Jacob did whatever he could do to get what he wanted from God. Now, I don't believe he did it the right way. He was deceptive. He deceived, he lied, he cheated, and he stole something that was not intended for him. But what was interesting, remember the prophecy that God gave to the mom? She said, the youngest will become the leader and the oldest will serve the youngest. So it was foreknown that this was going to happen. Because God always knows the plan. He always knows what's going down. And when we look at this, it begins to make me think, we cannot trade what God wants to give us for immediate things, for short-term things. See, Esau regretted later that he was so impulsive about trading the gifts. But you understand, it's not like it is today. You couldn't just take it back. The dad couldn't be like, oh, my bad, I'm, I'm gonna take that blessing back. No, when the blessing was given, it was not only a physical act, but a spiritual act that happened as well. Because God was moving in this family. He was moving in the promises and, and with all these things. So when God made this happen, this was big and it could not be taken back. But it happened and it was stolen. And here we see that Esau wept and sobbed violently. Esau had a great deal of remorse for what he did. He cried tears. But can I just be totally honest with you tonight? Sometimes tears don't mean anything. Sometimes tears don't mean anything. See, God doesn't want you to just feel sorry for your sin. He wants you to be sorry for your sin. And there's a big difference about feeling and being. Being is an actual reality that actually happens. Feelings like, oh, I might, I might just feel that way. It is almost like an optional thing. And we've got to understand when we're in relationship with God and we're doing this right or wrong thing and we mess up and we make a mistake and we go to God and we want to uh, forgiveness and we want to apologize, we've got to understand that remorse is just a feeling that can happen, but repentance is an action that says, I will change. Let's talk about this concept that we hear so much even from a young age to an old age, the three words that say, I am sorry. I am sorry. Let's just talk about that for one moment. See, I, 
I think about that statement, I am sorry, and I, I wonder if we even understand what it means anymore. Because when we look at this story, Esau was really upset and he was really sorry that this happened, but there was nothing that could really change. We say sorry all the time. There are people that, 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 for, you know, that mess up and say sorry. There are people that, even when they don't mess up, they say sorry. You know, it's become something that's in, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You did this, oh, I'm sorry, you did that, oh, I'm sorry. And sorry becomes something that becomes so repetitive in our life that we just say it all the time. As soon as you make a mistake, oh, I'm sorry. Or as soon as you do this, oh, I'm sorry. Even at a young age, even at a young age, when you are little and you are a little kid and little Micah decides to go and smack his sister with a wiffle ball bat, Right? Mom says, go to your sister and say you're sorry. What do you do? I'm sorry, but you're really not sorry. You're really not sorry. You are, but think about how we're programmed to just apologize because it's a culturally thing to do. We just got to apologize because that's the way that things are. And we have to understand that sometimes we say sorry and we're not even sorry. All we're doing is saying sorry so that we can smooth things over. We apologize just because we want to make things a little bit better. Just a little bit better. We don't even really mean when we're sorry when we do things. We do it in life all of the time. If I just say I'm sorry, then you know what, maybe she'll calm down. If I just say I'm sorry, maybe he'll just chill out. And we have this concept of an apology being something that we just do and say, just like we say anything else, just like we say hello, goodbye. I'm sorry has just become something so common to us. Guys, we have to understand something that's so important. The concept of an apology, I'm sorry, it's proven not by words, but by action. But by action. Because I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm gonna say this. And this is what I believe. I believe after Esau did the whole thing with the soup bowl, I believe if he would have went after the heart of God, things could have changed for him. I believe that if he went to God and he repented and he apologized, he said, listen, I messed up. I did this with my brother. I need, I need help. I believe that Esau could have really made it right. And he threw his actions, he could have. But guess what? He didn't. He did the exact opposite. God gave him all these lists of things. You need to do this, this, and this. And Esau's like, nah, I ain't even worried about that. I'm gonna go live the life I wanna live. So you gotta have this understanding that when, we're, when there's an apology, an apology comes with actions in your life. If you just say words, words are just words. They don't even mean anything. I really do believe that Esau was probably sorry about what he did. I believe that he could have turned his life around and followed after God and truly changed. But I wanna tell you something tonight, and if there's anything that you get tonight, this is what I want you to get. The words, I am sorry, should be words that have value. Listen to me, the words I am sorry are something that should have value to you as a person. See, value is something that's important. When you have money, when you have a lot of money, it's something valuable. When you have something that, that, that means a lot, it's valuable. So you need to allow the concept of an apology, the concept of I'm sorry, to be something that's valuable in your life. Don't say it if you don't mean it. Listen to me, don't say it if you don't mean it. It's cheap. No one wants cheap. You don't want something cheap. Like, we want something good. We want something, you know, great. If I'm hungry and someone gives me cheap food, I don't want cheap food. Give me something good. Give me something that's going to fill me up. I want something great. I don't want something of cheap quality. I want something of value. See, an apology needs to have value. And what I'm talking about tonight, yeah, I'm talking about when you apologize to one another, that needs to have value. It really does. You need to be very quick to think about the words, I am sorry, rather than just leave your mouth when you make a mistake. You really need to make that happen. That really needs to be something that's true and that needs to be something that's genuine in your life. But more importantly, when you mess up and go to God and you say, I'm sorry, it needs to be something that you really change through the actions of your life and not by what you say. But you see, God watches these things. He watches these things. And he wants to know, is, are they truly repentant? Are they truly mean what they say when they say, I'm sorry? They keep lying over and over and over again. And they keep getting in trouble over and over and over again. And they keep telling me, I'm sorry. Do they really mean it? And if we're not changing, then guess what? We don't really mean it. We don't really mean it. We just say sorry because we have to. Just like we say sorry to our mom or dad, we say sorry to God. God wants you to be sorry with your life. He wants you to be sorry, saying, you know what, I'm gonna change my actions and I'm gonna do things differently. See, Esau robbed himself of a spiritual inheritance because he could not get it right. And Jacob took it. And we're gonna talk about a little bit next week, the 
this, this whole story that, that ends up happening because now Jacob's got to leave because Esau's looking to kill him. That's how bitter and mad that makes him. He goes after his brother, and we're going to talk about that. But tonight, I want you to understand that when you seek forgiveness from God, your actions have to line up with what you're asking. When you're seeking forgiveness from one another, the I am sorry really needs to be something of value. Because if you continually say it over and over and over and over and over again, it doesn't mean anything. And if you continue to say it, people will know it, be like, oh man, that, that guy just says it all the time. He don't mean it. He says it constantly. So in this story, as we, as we think about this, the biggest thing I want to ask you, when we apologize to God, does it have value? Does your apology have value to God? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Here in a few minutes, we are going to move into group, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this. But before we jump in and before we, we go to those groups, when we apologize to God, I want you to think about it. Does it have value? All heads bowed and eyes closed. No one looking around, please be respectful. Be respectful. Because this is about you and God. This is about when God has asked you to do something and you do completely opposite. Do you choose to give value to the repentance that you're trying to seek from him? Or is it just another terminology that you throw out? Is it just another thing that you say to say it? We have to understand an apology has to have value. And that value is backed up by the lifestyle that you choose to live from this point forward. And it might seem like so elementary to say, well, Micah, you're talking about an apology tonight. Yeah, I am, because guess what? We don't get it. We haven't got it yet. We don't get these things right, so we need to talk about it till we get it right. And if we can't do it with each other, we'll never be able to do it with God. And so God, tonight my prayer is for each and every one of us that you will help us to learn to be those that seek an apology, that seek a life change because we give into this immediate need sometimes and we don't know and we don't do what we should. And so God, I pray tonight that you will help us be better. I pray that you will give us a heart to go after the good things, the right things of you. God, I pray that we won't be deceptive in trying to get things from you, but God, we will do things the right way. We'll do things the way that we are created to do them. And so God, I pray tonight that we will have a heart that is shifted and changed and that a heart that truly repents. And when we mean, I'm sorry, God, that's what we say. So God, forgive us tonight of the things that we have done. God, allow us to fall deeper in love with you than ever before. Change us, challenge us, and renew us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.